Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed, and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. They completely destroyed everything in it. The men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all the other relatives who were with her. Joshua chapter 6, verses 20 through 23, New Living Translation. Hello, and welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm Victoria Kay. This is our seventh episode in our series on archaeology and the Bible. Throughout the series, we have been talking about the large number of archaeologic finds that supply evidence that confirm that the history contained in the Bible is real history. It's popular today, especially in academia and the media, to attempt to dismiss the long-standing relationship between the Bible and archaeology. But when reviewed objectively, the only fair conclusion is that archaeology has been extremely supportive of the Bible's trustworthiness. To help us continue to explore this topic, in the studio today we have R.D. Fierro. R.D. is an author and the founder of Crystal Sea Books. Thus far in our series, we have reviewed a number of specific archaeologic finds that have confirmed details of the Bible. But you said that today you wanted to switch things up a bit. What do you have in mind? Well. Thus far in this series, we have mostly been talking about archaeological finds and artifacts that have come from places that are today in ruins. But before we get too far into our topic for today, I would also like just to greet everyone and welcome them to Anchored by Truth. I'd also like just to remind everybody that the reason that Anchored by Truth is going through these episodes on archaeology and the Bible is because archaeology provides some of the most powerful confirmation that the history that the Bible contains is accurate. And if we have confidence in the historicity of the Bible, that helps to give us confidence that the entire Bible is true. The entire Bible is true, whether we have confidence in it or not. But our individual faith and the faith of our families and friends can depend on whether or not they've been assaulted by the world. The world throws a lot of obstacles in the face of people today who want to accept the Bible. Well, the good news is that the Bible can defend itself, and it does that because the Bible, as we say, is the truth. And so that's why we call our show Anchored by Truth. Well, as I mentioned, most of the archaeological finds and artifacts that we have been talking about in this series came from places that today, those places are in ruins. I mean, some of the sites that we have been talking about were destroyed so thoroughly, like the city of Nineveh, for instance. The city of Nineveh was the capital of the ancient Assyrian Empire. Some of these sites were destroyed so thoroughly that they were lost to secular history, and they were considered in some cases almost legendary. But today, we're going to talk about a city that not only plays a prominent role in the Bible, but that city is still in existence today and that is the city of Jericho. Jericho is one of the few cities that is mentioned very early in the Old Testament and comes back later in the New Testament, but Jericho is still around today. Most of the locations from the biblical history, they've turned into piles of rubble or rock, and they've disappeared sometimes between multiple layers of sand or rock or dirt. But Jericho didn't. It still exists today in the West Bank Territory, And according to recent estimates, it has about 20,000 occupants. Well, we do want to note, though, that even though we're still talking about the same city, the city of Jericho, that even though the city exists, that it is not on exactly the same spot of ground as the Old Testament city of Jericho that is mentioned in the book of Joshua. Some scholars believe that Jericho may be the oldest continuously occupied city in the world. And while the secular dating of how long Jericho has been around doesn't conform with a biblical view, pretty much everybody agrees Jericho is thousands of years old. 
Jericho is well known to students of the Bible and even in popular culture because of the incident that is related in chapter 6 of the book of Joshua. We heard a part of the description of that incident in our opening scripture. Just to refresh everyone's recollection, though, the book of Joshua is set in history just as the Israelites are ending the 40 years of wandering in the desert. Moses has died, but before he did, he named Joshua as his successor to actually lead the Hebrews across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land to begin their occupation of it. While it's not evident today, Jericho was a very imposing obstacle in Joshua's day. Its defensive walls were famous, and since it was located near one of the fords in the Jordan River, it occupied a strategic location. Right. Now, both militarily and psychologically, it was important for the Israelites to conquer Jericho if they were ever going to have any hope of actually fulfilling the mandate that they had received from God to take possession of the land of Canaan. The city of Jericho essentially confronted the Israelites just as soon as they had crossed the Jordan River and actually entered into what they would have called the Promised Land. So the big question for Joshua and the Hebrews was how in the world could they defeat Jericho? How in the world could they defeat this city? Now let's remember that while the number of Hebrews that had come through the wilderness wanderings was sizable, I mean some scholars estimate that there were as many as two million people in total, that this group of people was not a well-equipped army. It was essentially a large band of farmers, shepherds, tradespeople, who had very little, if any, in the way of significant weaponry. The only weapons the Bible mentions that the Israelites had were personal weapons like swords and bows and arrows. During their 40 years of wandering through the wilderness, the Israelites were a nomadic people. They pitched camp wherever the Lord told them to, and they moved when the Lord told them to. They were always accompanied by their flocks and herds. Their shelters were tents. The largest structure they ever built was the temple, which was itself just a large tent. In short, they didn't spend any time or have the opportunity to build a real army or develop the kind of weapons an army would need to take on a walled and fortified city like Jericho. Swords and arrows aren't much good against walls that were, according to archaeological excavations, up to six feet thick and as much as 40 feet or more high. Armies that would tackle fortifications like that would have catapults, towers, and siege engines. The Hebrews didn't have any of those things. But, of course, the Hebrews did have God on their side. There's an old saying that says, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Amen to that. Well, the point is that Jericho would have been a very imposing obstacle to the Israelites who were just entering the promised land. And humanly speaking, they really did not have any way to breach the walls of Jericho. Now, fortunately for them, they wouldn't have to. All the Hebrews had to do to breach the walls of Jericho was obey God's instructions. And God told them if they did obey him, he would deliver the city into their hands. Well, at this stage of their national history, the Israelites were still being obedient to God. Later on, that would change, sadly, but at least at this point in their national history, the Israelites were still being relatively obedient to God. But, as you said, At this time, the Hebrews under Joshua were still obeying God. God told them to march around the city once for six days. Then he told them to march around the city seven times on the seventh day. After their final circuit, God told them that when they shouted, the walls of Jericho would collapse and they would be able to charge straight into the city. They did exactly as told, and the Bible tells us that the walls fell down and the Hebrews were able to take the city. The only people who survived was Rahab the harlot and her family who were with her because she had sheltered the Hebrew spies. It's a dramatic story that has been popularized in various songs, books, and movies. So, naturally, the question occurs as to whether there is any archaeologic evidence that supports the biblical account. And, not surprisingly, there is. The Old Testament city of Jericho is located at a site that is called Tel El Sultan today. And extensive excavations have been conducted at that site throughout the years. And we know from those excavations that the ruins that have been uncovered of the ancient city of Jericho provide substantial confirmation of the biblical account of the episode that is particularly described in chapter 6 of the book of Joshua. Well, 
Then let's go through some of the evidence that has been uncovered. For our listeners' benefit, we want you to know that there are a couple of very good articles on the Creation Ministry International website that deal with the archaeologic work that has been done at Jericho. But for this episode, we have also used material from Dr. Gleason Archer's book, The Encyclopedia of Biblical Difficulties, and The Archaeological Study Bible. The Archaeological Study Bible is a particularly helpful book for any Bible student that wants to explore the connection between the Bible and archaeology. There are literally hundreds of articles, comments, maps, and pictures that demonstrate that the Bible is a book firmly set in place and time. And the fact that such a book can be produced for the Bible sets the Bible apart from all other ancient or modern books that claim to have divine inspiration. So, where do you want to start talking about the evidence from archaeology that supports the biblical account? Well, we can start from the fact that Jericho was, in fact, strongly fortified. Excavations have shown that Jericho actually had two sets of walls. The mound of Jericho was surrounded by a great earthen embankment, and it had a stone retaining wall right at the base of that embankment. Now, this retaining wall was about 12 to 15 feet high. And on top of that embankment was a mud brick wall that was six feet thick and over 20 feet high. So that means that the Israelites who were standing on the outside of this lower wall would have been staring up at a wall that was close to 40 feet high. In other words, the attacking Hebrews would have been facing a wall that was close to four stories tall. That would have been both imposing and discouraging. Absolutely. And that was just the lower wall. At the top of this large embankment was a similar mud brick wall whose base was roughly 46 feet above the ground level that was outside of the retaining wall. Well, this very imposing wall system was looming high above the Israelites as they were going to go marching around the city once a day for the first six days. So, humanly speaking, it was impossible for the Israelites to penetrate the impregnable bastion that was Jericho. Archaeologists estimate that within the upper walled section was an area of approximately six acres. Based on an archaeologist's rule of thumb of approximately 200 persons per acre, the population of the upper city would have been about 1,200 people. Archaeologists estimate that the total area within the walls of Jericho, including the lower walled portion, was about nine acres. We also now know from excavations carried out by a German team that people were also living on the embankment between the upper and lower city walls. And it's reasonable to believe that as the Israelite army was approaching Jericho, that Canaanites living in surrounding villages would have fled to Jericho for safety. Thus, it's quite likely there were several thousand people inside the walls when the Israelites came against the city. Right. So, one element of the biblical story that is attested to by archaeology is that Jericho was strongly fortified and it could have held enough people to be militarily significant. Now, a second element that archaeology has shown to us is that the city of Jericho, which was significant, was still small enough for the Israelite army to be able to march around it seven times in one day. Now, if the Israelites were marching around this city, understand they wouldn't have been marching right next to the walls. That would have made them vulnerable to objects that were tossed off the walls like rocks. So let's just assume that they would have marched far enough away from the walls to have a reasonable margin of safety. So the distance that would have required on a single trip around Jericho, uh, that would have been in the range of about 3,500 to 4,000 feet. Now, there are 5,280 feet per mile. So even if they marched around a 4,000-foot perimeter seven times, that's a total distance of only about five miles. Now, the Israelites have been trekking through the wilderness for 40 years, and people who have been trekking through a desert wilderness for 40 years, they can certainly have a five-mile walk and not be worn out. So they could have marched around the wall seven times, easily had plenty of energy and strength to actually attack the city and destroy the occupants of the city. The archaeologic excavations at Jericho have also revealed that the city's freestanding inner and outer mud brick walls collapsed outward. That means they fell down the slope and piled up at the base of the mound. This is consistent with how the Bible describes the walls collapsed. The Legacy Standard Bible put it this way in Joshua chapter 6, verse 5, quote, 
And it will be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down beneath itself, and the people will go up every man straight ahead." Unquote. Once the walls collapsed, this allowed the invading Israelites to go straight up and into the city. This is consistent with what the Bible says in verse 20 of the same chapter. Now, a third element of the archaeological evidence that supports the biblical account is that there is a one-meter-thick layer of ash and debris found inside the city, and that included some jars of burnt wheat. And these jars of burnt wheat were found in many sections of the city. Let's go back to the book of Joshua. Chapter 6, verse 24 says, quote, Then the Israelites burned the whole city and everything in it. So there is evidence in the ruins of Jericho that the city was, at one point in their history, burned. And the fact that the jars were full of burnt wheat is consistent with the Bible's report that the attack took place just after the harvest. Joshua chapter 3, verse 15 says that the Hebrews crossed the Jordan River just before attacking Jericho in the harvest season. Moreover, the fact that there was grain in the charred jars is evidence that the siege of Jericho was a short one. According to the Bible's description, the siege lasted just seven days. If it had been a long siege, the people who had fled into the city would have eaten the grain in the jars. Also, the fact that archaeologists found grain in the jars was evidence that most of the Hebrews complied with the Lord's instructions to not take plunder for themselves from the city. In Joshua chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, Joshua had said to the Israelites, quote, Keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury, unquote. Grain would have been a valuable commodity to an attacking army. An army certainly would have taken any food stores in the city with them under normal circumstances. The fact that the grain was left shows that whoever sacked the city and set fire to it is unusual, but is entirely consistent with the Bible's account. And let's mention one final piece of evidence which was found at Jericho, which is consistent with the Bible. The Bible explicitly says that the harlot Rahab's house was built into the city wall of Jericho. Joshua chapter 2 verse 15 says, quote, So Rahab let the Hebrew spies down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall, end quote. Well, as the archaeologists were exploring the walls of Jericho that had fallen down, they discovered a section of the lower city wall that had not collapsed in the same way as other parts of the walls. Now, there's an article on Creation Ministries' website that puts it this way, quote, The German excavation of 1907 to 1909 found that on the north, a short stretch of the lower city wall did not fall as everywhere else a portion of that mud brick wall was still standing to a height of over eight feet. What is more, there were houses built against the wall. So it's quite possible that this is where Rahab's house was. Since the city wall formed the back wall of the houses, the spies could have readily escaped. From this location on the north side of the city, it was only a short distance to the hills of the Judean wilderness where the spies hid for three days. And that ends the quote. So the main point of all this evidence that we are citing is that there is ample archaeologic evidence to support the reliability of the Bible's account the Israelites captured the city of Jericho. But I think some people might ask the question, why does it matter whether the story as told in the Bible is true? Some people might say that even if the story was an embellished account, what difference does it make? Or, does it even matter if the story is just an amazing legend that was used to inspire generations of Hebrew children? And the short answer to those questions is that it makes all the difference in the world whether the story is true. I mean, let's step back for a second and remember that the Bible is a single book about a single plan and that the Bible's content was selected by a single mind, the mind of God. And God had a purpose for everything that he chose to put in the Bible. Now, there's a lot of history in the Bible, such as the history that's found in the book of Joshua, but none of that history is there by accident. 
God wanted, and he wants his people to learn things from the history that he chose to include in the Bible. So, what are some of the good things God wants us to learn from the Hebrew encounter with Jericho? Well, let's remember that when this encounter occurs in the larger plan of redemptive history, the Hebrews were just coming out of a 40-year period of wandering in the desert after they had left captivity in Egypt, where they had been miraculously delivered by God. And we're all pretty well familiar with the ten plagues that God visited upon the Egyptians that ultimately caused the Egyptians to let the Hebrews go. But a lot of people forget that the group that was entering the Promised Land was not the same group that had left Egypt. Except for Joshua and Caleb, all of the Israelites, all of the Hebrews who had left Egypt, had died in the desert because they had rebelled against the Lord in one way or another. Now, Caleb and Joshua were still with the group and still very much alive and still very capable of participating in a war, because when Moses had sent the 12 spies, one from each tribe, to scout out the land for the Israelites, 10 of the 12 spies came back and said, Oh no, it will be too difficult for us to conquer that land. We must return to Egypt. Well, two of the spies did not. Two of the spies said to the Israelites, Oh, we can conquer that land. Our Lord will deliver it into our hands. We just have to have the faith and the trust in the Lord to go up and do what he's told us to do. And those two spies that said that God was going to be faithful was Caleb and Joshua. So the two Israelites who did not die wandering in the wilderness were Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses had died. God had not permitted Moses or his brother Aaron to enter the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 50 through 52, God said, quote, There on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites, in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Therefore, you will see the land only from a distance. You will not enter the land I am giving to the people of Israel. Right. So the group of Israelites that was entering the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb, was not the same group that had personally seen the miracles that God had performed in Egypt as a part of delivering them from bondage. So this group that's entering Canaan might be wondering, well, how can we be sure that God is going to help us displace the Canaanites and enable us to take possession of the land? Well, certainly by helping the Hebrews, the Israelites, to overcome the first major obstacle they would encounter after crossing the Jordan was going to be a powerful signal that even though almost all of their previous leaders had died, that God was very much still alive and still in command. So the miraculous conquest of Jericho was going to be a dramatic signal to the Hebrews that as long as they were obedient to him, God was going to assure them that they obtained the inheritance that he had promised. And the Hebrews' experience at Jericho is still a valuable lesson for us. God had led the Hebrews to Jericho. They were in the center of his will as they were staring up at the walls. The fact that they were facing this huge obstacle as they were seeking to do His will wasn't because they had done anything wrong, at least at that point. They were doing what God had commanded them to do. But that didn't mean they weren't going to encounter obstacles and opposition. I think that's a great lesson for us. Sometimes we are doing things that we feel led by God to do, and just as soon as we start doing them, we encounter opposition. That may make some people question whether God really wants them to do it. Obstacles in fulfillment of our purpose shouldn't deter us or cause us to turn aside. Right. You know, even if we are doing exactly what God wants us to do, we can and we should expect opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil, because those are the three traditional enemies of all Christians. Overcoming opposition is a part of God's plan for our lives. God intends for us to encounter opposition but he also intends for us to overcome that opposition. And that's why it matters that the story of Joshua's conquest of Jericho is true. Humanly speaking, Joshua and his soldiers, they may or may not have been ultimately able to breach Jericho's walls, but they sure were not going to do it in a matter of days. It would have been a matter of months and maybe years. And in the meantime, the Hebrews would have been exposed to counterattacks from the surrounding Canaanite cities and tribes. It was going to be vital to enable Joshua to keep the momentum going for them to get past the city of Jericho quickly. They needed God's help. Well, 
Because we know that the story in the book of Joshua chapter 6 is true, then we can be confident that they got the help when they needed it. They got the help they needed, and they got the help when they needed it. That gives us hope that we can receive help from that same God when we need it. We might be able to learn lessons from stories. Jesus used parables to teach. But if we want real hope, we need examples real examples of when our God came to the aid of his people. That's one of the things we get from the story of Jericho. But we only get that if the story is real history. This sounds like a great time to pray. Today, let's listen to a prayer for our friends. Most of us may not be called to be missionaries in the faraway lands, but we are all called to be missionaries to the people in our families and communities. A prayer for friends. Heavenly Lord and Holy Father, we bless you and exalt you as we bow down before you. We are grateful that we can come into your presence and find a willing and loving master. You are the one who framed the mountains and carved out the oceans. How much more then can you assist your children? Lord, we thank you for the blessings of having friends. We believe that it is you who brings people into our lives who are a source of joy and fulfillment to us. We pray that you would help us to provide the same blessings to others. We thank you that you have helped us to meet people who help us to go beyond ourselves. Friends whose hearts are loving and generous toward us and who have steadfast spirits that keep them with us, even during the difficult times. We pray that you would bless our friends with health, strength, and prosperity. We ask that you would look into the deepest recesses of their hearts, as only you can, and find the secret hopes and dreams there. As it conforms to your will, fulfill their desires, and bring them more completely into your presence. Seek out those who do not yet embrace your name and your Son and bring them into communion with you. Let them know that only friendships grounded in you will last for eternity and that joy unspeakable awaits those who put on Christ and then fellowship in His kingdom. Help us to be sensitive to the dings and dents of life that afflict others and help us to speak kind and encouraging words especially when troubles are weighing them down. Help us to take action where such action will relieve pain or provide comfort. But help us also to know the boundaries that we should not cross. As Christ did, let us build relationships among the people we treasure and help us always to seek the good of others, even when we must set some of our own desires aside. It is your good pleasure to provide good gifts to us all, and it is impossible that we should ever bless others without being blessed by you. Bring harmony and peace to our relationships. Help us for our part to not injure or grieve others. Help us to be peacemakers using the example that your Son gave to us. Forgive us and help us to forgive others that all will know that we are the possession of your Son. In Christ's name we pray and offer praise. Amen. Amen. Is the Bible important in your life? Supporting Anchored by Truth with a contribution is an easy way to put your faith into action. The opportunity to help is available at crystalseabooks.com. How wonderful would it be for Jesus to commend us because we made His Word a priority in our lives and giving. We are grateful for your support and partnership. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage friends to tune in also or to listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalseabooks.com where We're not perfect, but our boss is. And for those of you who need that website one more time, that's crystalcbooks.com. Crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, C, 
S E A and books, B O O K S dot com. Thank you for your support.